What's up, everyone? This is Xavier, your host, and welcome to the 210 Stockyard. So Saturday night's game was hard to watch. I stayed up for all of it, and in the end, I was disappointed just like all of you were. Now, first and foremost, I just want to say I am not a naysayer. I am not jumping ship. I've been a Brahmas fan since day one before we even had the draft when they announced that we were getting a team. Before we even had a logo, I was a fan. And I will continue to be a fan. I'm just simply calling it like I see it. And it is my opinion. And again, I'm just a guy on the couch. But it is my opinion that we do need, at the very least, to change the quarterback role. But I do want to say this. Despite our record, and despite the bad start that we've had this season, we are still in the hunt. We can definitely still make the playoffs. And I actually think that we will make the playoffs we're not out of it yet and i haven't lost faith am i disappointed absolutely but am i giving up no not at all so stay with me i'm definitely going to explain why i think we're still in it and how we can pull this off we're actually still in good shape believe it or not but first i do want to break down game four and i want to cover what things that i saw wrong and things that need to change or should change especially if this team is serious about making a playoff run here we go. We start the game out 3-0, and this is our opening drive. First play is a 9-yard pass to Alizé Mack. He, by the way, has the most receptions on the team. That was his 11th on the season. So next play, okay, you're thinking it's 2nd and 1. We can just give it to Balazs or Patrick, but instead, this is what happened. All you needed was 1 yard, but instead, you attempted 20 yard pass and so right here you can see as soon as the running back gets the ball he's gonna have an open lane and the defender is guarding behind the line of the game so even if that defender met him he would have got him right where forward progress was going to be met so that would have been a safe running play to make at that time now if you look at where the receiver was at for this play if he would have caught that ball he would have ran smack into the defender that was waiting on him. So even if he caught the ball, who knows if he would have held on to it. Now it's third and one. Now you're thinking, okay, let's go ahead and run it with one of our big backs, right? No, this is what they do. I can't even begin to describe what was supposed to happen on that play. Kalen Balaj and Jaquez Patrick are probably size-wise like height and weight, the two biggest running backs in the XFL right now. And instead of trusting one of them to gain one yard, you give it to this very immobile quarterback who just turned his back and fell. Then moving on, later on in the first, there's about a minute left. So third and 18, if you do not convert or get a touchdown in this play, your next play has to be a field goal. So the ball's on the 27 yard line, and to get to a first down, you need to get to right there within the nine yard mark. This is what they did. An eight yard pass. Now you can tell me that maybe they're just trying to get the ball closer for the kicker, okay? I might believe that, except that our kicker, prior to this game, his long was for 48 yards back there somewhere. He also kicked a 58 yarder later on in this game. So you can't tell me that they were just trying to give the kicker a few more yards to work with. But even when you look back at it in slow motion, that was the only available receiver for him to throw to at that time. So I'm just going to chalk that up to very bad play call. So we end up settling for the field goal. Romo makes it. Now I'm bringing this up just because uh, I saw some people complaining or saying maybe that we shouldn't have wasted our challenge here at this time, but I like it. We ended up winning the challenge. It did swing momentum in our favor, even though again, the offense just couldn't capitalize on it. But I like the decision because it shows faith in our defense. I like seeing the coach, you know, have trust in his players that he was pushed off when he says he was. It ended up helping make the stop to Seattle and giving the offense a chance. Again, the offense just didn't capitalize. Fast forward to the fourth quarter. 
it's six to nine we're only down by three there's still 944 left on the clock so we have time there wasn't a need to rush down the field all we had to do was take our time and basically take whatever the defense gave us it was third and short again you only needed two yards instead of running we decide to throw downfield. Fast forward, there's three minutes left. Now we're down by nine at this point. It's still a one possession game. Bad protection causes the fumble. And lucky enough, we were able to recover it. The ensuing play, it's third and 11. I think it should have been a first down, but oh well. Now Seattle's gonna challenge, and they're gonna lose. They're challenging that there was offensive pass interference. There wasn't, so they lose their challenge and timeout game continues. Now pay attention to the commentators as they point out the struggles that San Antonio has been having running the ball on short downs. So it's fourth and one. Once again, it's short down short yardage and instead of running we throw it. Let's go ahead and look at each player as the play breaks down. So you're gonna see Fred Brown right here. So he runs up and by this point he's open. But Cohen's not even gonna look his way. He's not even gonna pay attention to him or even try to survey or read the field. Brown appears to have been able to make this catch as enough of a cushion between him and his defender makes that hook back in towards the line to gain. I think that's the first down right there if you pass to him. Now, yes, there was contact. Yes, it looked like it might have been pass interference, but since we used our challenge flag early, we cannot challenge here. Just gotta let it go, guys. So the game is on the line at this point. Again, you need one yard to stay alive. It's fourth and one. I don't know why we didn't attempt to run this ball. I don't know why we didn't attempt a running play. But once again, let's check out the commentary after the play. That says a lot though about the state of the offensive line. And then a few moments later, this happens. gonna win this game with defense. Well, they are a team that came into this season as a cold favorite in the XFL. Is it picked off? San Antonio with the chance. Seattle, what are you doing? Come on! Arku with the pick. Hold that thought. The defense shows up. Luke Barku played his ass off. He, had, he, he did amazing in that game. He was making plays all night, he did a great job keeping Josh Gordon in check, and he made the play to give us one more chance to make a comeback. Here's the ensuing first and 10 play, and it results in a sack. Second and 15. Horrible pass, it's overthrown. Third and 15, there's 118 left. You have to convert. And there it is. First and ten. Another bad pass. And once again, there may have been possible contact, but we can't challenge. Alright, now pay attention to the next play. There's an obvious player on the defense who goes offside, and Cohen doesn't even seem to notice. Now first, on a free play, Everyone knows you take the shot downfield. If it's incomplete, no worries. If it gets picked off, doesn't matter, it's coming back. That's why it's called a free play. You take your chance, you take your shot downfield. You had a free play, and this is what you choose to do with the ball. Now I understand that the rusher got there quick because he jumped early, but Cohen still made a pass that if, even if it was complete, would have been completed for no gain. That was a waste of a free play, and in my opinion, that's just bad quarterback. I'm just calling it like I see it. That was not a good decision. Now it's second and five because of the flag, and for some reason, overthrows the heck out of Jalen Tolliver. Next play, third and five. Cohen seems to panic and just gets rid of it. 
Now it's fourth and five. Once again, now you have to convert. This is the game on the line. This is essentially could be the last play of the game. And once again, we get a free play. Now I'll admit there wasn't much that could be done on this play. The line kind of broke down almost immediately, but we still convert. It's first and 10. And Cohen, once again, just throws it away. Second and 10. I thought he converts, they called it short. It's third and one. You have to convert. It's short yardage, we only need one yard. Cohen takes a hit as he passes, incomplete. So it's third and one. There's still about 28 seconds left. You still have one timeout and you still attempt to convert a downfield pass to Jalen Tolliver. I don't know why you're still passing downfield. This could have easily been a first down. So the running back is wide open at this point. He could have caught that pass and at the very least been tackled right at the line of the game for first down. Even here at this point, if he would have been looking for it, you could have caught him in stride. You could have easily given him the ball, and who knows, he still may have ran, ran for another 10, 15, maybe 20 yards. And then you go back and you look at the wide receiver set. Okay, you got three of them lined up at the bottom of your screen, one at the top. So that's Jalen Tolliver, that's Fred Brown, and I believe that's the tight end Alizé Mack. So right before Cohen takes the hit to the arm, he still had a shot downfield. These were going to be contested catches as well. I think they had a better percentage. You still could have hit Fred Brown right here. And who knows, you could have just taken the shot. If you really wanted to take a shot, I would have rather taken a shot downfield with Alizé Mack right there. If he catches that, I didn't see anyone in front of him that could have potentially stopped him. And again, if they did, you still had your timeout and you could have set something up. But instead, you through attempted that pass to Jalen Tolliver. Pressure came, Cohen got scared, and he just got rid of it. Ball game. And then once again, I'll let you hear some of the commentary because they just seem to be reading my mind all night. And for the second time in the last few minutes, San Antonio goes through the air on fourth and short. Now I know everyone is already wanting to place blame, and I myself can't blame you. Starting out 1-3 and three isn't how I wanted this to go either, but this is where we are. Now I do agree with everyone saying that we need to change the quarterback, because in my opinion, and I hate to be a naysayer or a negative, but I'm sorry to say, Jack Cohn isn't it. You can go back and look at any of my previous videos that I've made, and I myself always had him as number 3 on our depth chart. I think Jawan Pass should be our starter. I have no idea what's going on with him. I'm tempted to make a deep dive video on exactly why we are not utilizing him because as far as I can tell, he is not injured. He has not been placed on the official injury roster on the official XFL.com website. However, he always shows up on the official game day injury report. So I don't understand what's keeping him out of the game. My other question is, is Reed Sinet that bad? Is he really that bad in practice or in warm-ups that we can't even give him a series or two to try him out. Also, offensive coordinator, what are you thinking? Why do we keep why do we keep running plays that don't make sense according to the down? Any down and short. And instead of running it, you pass it or you do something ridiculous. I don't understand the scheme. I don't understand why you're making the calls that you're making. Also, the offensive line. For as good as the weapons are on offense, we do have, we actually do have, on paper, good receivers, good tight ends, and really good running backs. But it doesn't matter how good they are if that line cannot protect, cannot give the quarterback time to make the play, cannot get the receivers time to get where they need to get to catch the ball. Yes, there have been bad coaching decisions. Yes, there have been very bad play calling and offensive schemes. But ultimately, if that offensive line isn't clicking, if they aren't protecting, if they aren't creating gaps, there's not much we can do. We can't just make the O-line gain skill overnight. 
And it's not like we can just go and sign a whole new O-line, you know, overnight as well. Sure, there's players available, but is it going to be better than what we currently have? I don't know. I seriously doubt it. Sure, a good quarterback helps, which is why I would like Jawan Pass in there, because a mobile quarterback, I've always said, a mobile quarterback, in my opinion, is going to be better for the simple fact that he can keep the play alive with his legs. And that is seriously what I think the Brahmas are needing right now. But again, if the O-line isn't doing its job and your quarterback isn't mobile or confident, it doesn't matter how good your receivers are and it doesn't matter how good the running backs are. The production is going to be what we have right now. Very minimal, very frustrating to watch. Now, I can't fault the defense at all. I think our defense played hard. They made plays when we asked them to. I think they did a great job of keeping the XFL's highest rated offense in check for virtually most of the game. And they even gave us a last minute chance to actually win the game. But ultimately, the offense just didn't come through for us. So defense, I've got no gripe with you. I actually love our defense right now. So we still have a chance at making the playoffs. I know it sounds crazy, but we actually do have a chance. Don't focus too much on our overall record. Instead, you need to focus on our division record. So yes, Houston's on top. They're 4-0. They're undefeated. They're pretty much already going to be in the playoffs. They're a virtual lock for the playoffs. I don't see them missing out. Orlando's not looking very good, being that they haven't won a game yet, and I don't honestly think they're going to win one anytime soon. So it comes down to Arlington and San Antonio. Now we have two games coming up with them, and in a worst case scenario, if we end the season with the exact record, this is how it would go down. So these are the actual standings, the XFL standings for how tiebreakers work, you know, who won more games head to head, if it's split, what was the best win-loss percentage within the division, and if your wins and losses in the division are still equivalent. Then it goes down to number four, strength of victory in all games, which is basically college rules with style points. So who beat who by more, and who had the better win against the same opponent? Now, if you guys want to pause and review all these uh, rules, you can, but I just wanted to point out the, the first one through four. So we're not even going to talk about Orlando right now because, honestly, I just don't think they have a chance of making it. They've already lost twice to Houston very badly. They've already lost to Arlington once, and they've lost to us once. I don't think they're going to be able to pull out another victory be between us. They might beat Arlington. That would help us out, but I don't think they're going to beat San Antonio. So Orlando's just out at this point. Now, if we look at both Houston and Arlington's schedule, Okay, so Houston played Orlando first, and they beat them the first time around by 21 points. They recently beat them again here in week 4 by 28 points. Now, when Arlington played them, Arlington did win, but they only won by one point. And when we played Orlando, we won by 18. So within the division, we are already looking better than Orlando, obviously, and now Arlington. Now, when you look at the head-to-head -head between Houston and Arlington, this is what happened. Houston beat them by nine, which means Arlington lost by nine. And ironically, when San Antonio played Houston, we also happened to lose by nine. So that right there is pretty much a wash. And that actually helps us out. Being that we both lost by the same amount, it negates that we lost to Houston, and it puts San Antonio and Arlington in more of a head-to-head -head situation which in my opinion is very doable. Now these are out of conference games, but I do want to just point out that when Arlington recently played St. Louis, they lost by 13 points. And honestly, they don't, I don't think they led at all that game. They were pretty much handled by St. Louis. When San Antonio played St. Louis, we had them the whole game and allowed them to win just because we let off the gas and we ended up losing by three. So even if for some reason we have to start going out of our division to determine who is going to be in first and second place, San Antonio is already in a better position just from our head-to-head -head with St. Louis. So essentially, we are already looking at a playoff picture here. The next two games in week five and six will be playoff implications for both San Antonio and Arlington. We play them this coming up week here in San Antonio in the Alamo Dome, and then we finish the back-to-back -back off up there in their house in Arlington and Choctaw Stadium. So in all honesty, 
we don't even need to beat them both games. Yes, I would love that. I mean, that would be ideal. But the good news is, if we happen to lose, we are okay. As long as we beat them by more points than they beat us. So if for everyone worried and freaking out, yes, it's a bad start, but again, I am nowhere near worried about it yet. I do think we still have a strong case to make the playoffs, and I do think we will make the playoffs. You guys just gotta have faith. Of course, changes need to be made, and I hope they are made, but only time will tell. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this helps ease the mind of the fan base out there. I'm still excited for this upcoming game day. I will be tailgating, so if you guys are there, stop by and say hi. Please like and subscribe if you're enjoying the content. And let me know what you guys think. What do you think about our most recent loss? How did you handle it? What do you think needs to change? Is Jack Cohen the quarterback or not? Is the offensive coordinator and the O-line coach on the hot seat? Do you think we'll make the playoffs? We'll soon find out. Stay tuned for another episode of the 210 Stockyard.